Okay, so boiling point and boiling point temperature are the same thing. Boiling point, VP, and boiling point temperature, same thing. Temperature at which something will boil. So what temperature does water boil at? Yep, yep, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 103 Celsius. Yep. So um, here's the deal. I like that video. Now I know why I like that video. Here is my boiling, or here's my water, and I'm going to use a Bunsen. There's my, my Bunsen burner. And so if I get, if I make my temperature equal to uh, 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, what's going to happen is this, these, these liquid, just like you saw in the video, that, uh, I'll have liquid, 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 liquid water particles, and then actually I'm going to have a bubble of uh, gas. And actually we're going to call that gas vapor. Gas and vapor mean the same thing. So vapor equals gas. Okay. And the thing about that, and you saw it in the video, that gas, these are my gas, my water gas particles, those gas particles, the pressure of those gas particles have to be equal to the pressure of, this is my atmosphere, this is my air all around the beaker. And the pressure of, generally speaking, of the atmosphere, P atmosphere, is runs about 760 millimeters of mercury. Or, or I believe it's we've done gas uh, pressures. That's the same thing as one atmosphere. We actually are exactly equal. Remember they had you guys did some conversions and exact relationship between the uh, millimeters of mercury and the atmosphere. So my point is is in order for it to boil, that gas needs to that pressure pressure of H2O, I'll put gas, needs to be equal to 760 from your short grain in order to break free and form and break free and rise up. And I like the video because it kind of showed that kind of the downward force of the atmosphere and this needs to be um, as, as great. And it's kind of a tipping point. It's not, or greater, it's just a tipping point. It is 760. So Exactly. So if we, there are different instructions, if you're making mac and cheese, there are different instructions. It says if you are on, here's my mountain, if you are boiling water on a mountain, the thing about it up here is down here we have uh, 760 millimeters of mercury. Up here you might have I don't know, 745 millimeters of mercury. So that means that you have less. And so then actually your boiling point temperature will actually be less than 100 degrees. And the reason then that you have different uh, preparations for your noodles is that um, here, less than 100 degrees. Uh, the reason that you have different uh, instructions for your noodles is that that water is not 100 degrees, it's like 97 degrees or whatever. And so you need boiled water. But today, part three, we'll be talking more about boiling in part four. Part three, the thing I want you to know is kind of, you saw a video that water slips its bonds, I just like Filtrate water slips its bonds. It's being disconnected from another water molecule, which means it can transition from a liquid to a gas. Or it can slip some of the bonds and transition from a solid to a liquid. That ease is all related to what we've been talking about, intermolecular bonds. And the thing about water is it has hydrogen bonding, which is even stronger than dipole-dipole, isn't it? So the boiling point, and remember, anytime you see boiling point, think boiling point temperature. The boiling point temperature of anything... <laughs> You're the one that has two like pencils. I just like to honor that. <laughs> Get it out, Daniel. So, um, boiling point and boiling point temperature means the same thing, okay? 
Uh, what you're looking at, and it's not labeled real well, but uh, along the y-axis is temperature, and along the x-axis is heat of aggregation. So this is delta H fat. Delta H fat, latent heat and vaporization. And this is uh, boiling point temperatures. I guess boiling point temperatures, we usually do it this way. Big T, B, P, boiling point temperatures. So it makes sense that as your heat of vaporization increase, your boiling point temperatures increase. Okay. Um, heat of vaporization, how easy is it to go from a liquid to a gas? Well, the more you have to pump it with, then your temperature, it boils up a little bit. So that makes sense. Okay. And this kind of, I was like, well, we kind of talked about that. And we did talk about this. Um, oh, this for some of the same sense. This says that if something, if you have to jack up the temperature in order to get something to boil, then it's harder to break the, the bonds. That just means you have stronger analytical bonds. That's it. Um, that would be for substances that have similar size and surface area. Okay. Um, and this is kind of, I think, related more to the next slide. Notice the second line in this blue here, it says generally if you have a larger molecule, it weighs more, and is it going to be more polarizable or less polarizable? More, more polarizable. And then if that happens, you get more possible the induced cycle, induced cycle action. Remember induced cycle, induced cycle, otherwise called dispersion forces, that's nonpolar stuff. But even, how do I say it, even a polar molecule has this dispersion forces going on. And the larger it is, the more you can get that action going on. Well, here's what I think to me, what you just said. If you have something that weighs more, okay, it's going to have a higher boiling point. Again, back to, this is assuming it has the same type of bonding as a neighbor, um, as a as a, for comparison between molecules or whatever. Okay, so the more, the higher the weight, uh, the more you can polarize it. Now, we actually ran into this last phenomenon that we talked about called branching, kind of, I think, yesterday. It's not really molecular weight affects polarizability, but it does. But it's also kind of how the atoms are distributed. If they're all balled up, you lose surface area. And if it's all balled up, you lose surface area. We say it's got a lot of branching and it's less polarizable. So that's kind of what uh, this is going to talk about, or going to talk about here in a minute. So it's a figure from OpenStax. It has, um, these are uh, some nonpolar molecules. It's funny because I was like, I knew that fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine were diatomic. I didn't know that's the be. So we have acetone molecule. Uh, when it comes to, notice they're arranged by increasing uh, weights, and that's the size, and that last column there is the temperature at which they would transition from a liquid to a gas, the boiling point temperatures. So definitely we see a nice increase in temperatures. Uh, we are going to, uh, later on, a few parts from now, talk about the transition from a liquid to a solid. Sorry. The transition from a solid to a liquid, otherwise known as melting, which is goes from solid to liquid. These temperatures aren't as clear cut uh, related to any more of a There's another element when it comes for something to transition from a solid to a liquid. That's what we're going to talk about. I kind of feel like we touched on this a little bit already. Um, these are taking, uh, the thing that these compounds all have in common is if you find carbon, silicon, um, yeah, germanium, and uh, antimony, or tin, sorry, tin, they're all uh, period 4A. Um, so, Oh, yeah. So let's see what we've got here. Um, period 40. 
group where I only have shared experience. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so notice that as we increase the molecular the weight, we're increasing the weight of molecules, we increase the weight of the central atom. Notice that um, the temperature, this boiling point temperature increases. These are still cold temperatures, aren't they? Like two, negative 180 Celsius. That's cold. Okay. But uh, that's even colder than negative 140. Okay. So, that's kind of interesting. All right. And the reason they increase is because you get that induced dipole, induced dipole action going on, otherwise known as dispersion forces. Uh, here's another table that kind of tries to show some trends with regard to boiling point temperatures and heat of vaporizations. The, these are all nonpolar. They're organized in increasing uh, molecular weight. And notice as you increase the molecular weight, you increase the boiling point temperature, the heat of vaporization. These are polar compounds over here, um, and again, arranged in order of increasing molecular weight. If it's polar, we definitely have some dipole-dipole interaction going. I don't see any hydrogen bonding that can happen with those substances in their pure form. But so it has dipole because dipole because it's polar, but it also has this uh, induced dipole and dispersion forces going. So as you increase the molecular weight, uh, 162 for the ICL is the heaviest. You have the highest boiling point temperature. And I'm not sure why there's no there's no heat of vaporization on the ICL. On the whole thing. Okay. I think we saw this video, but we'll look at What type of graph? Do you know what type of graph it is? No. <laughs> Line graph? Yeah. Whoa. Then where did you learn that? Sweet. <laughs> uh, so the blue line actually is what we just talked about. Uh, going ahead and substituting and getting uh, lighter and lighter uh, atoms, the central atom, it gets uh, uh, boils at a uh, lower temperature. And so you would expect the H2O to be here, but it's not, it's way up there. And uh, these actually then, remember the NOF? Remember the NOF? The NOF is where your hydrogen bonding takes in. So let's, if we go to uh, let's see, they got the, the old timing or the, the new timing things. Group, that was group 18. If we go to group 17 and 16, no, that was group 16. If we go to group 17 and 15, so this is group 17, this is group 15. Okay. Uh, with, you have the SB, AS, phosphorus, but when you go ahead and get to NH3, then you're back to hydrogen bonding. They kind of have analysis of compounds going on here on this slide. So those question marks are where we have hydrogen bonds. It looks like this. So I'm trying to show you the trend in um, uh, decreasing uh, decreasing boiling point temperatures, decreasing dispersion forces because of size, but it jumps up. Because we have hydrogen bonding with the oxygen, the chlorine, and the hydrogen. Excuse me, the oxygen, chlorine, and the hydrogen. All right. All right. So we're going to be talking more about how do we name things. And I think I might have mentioned alkane, the word alkane before. Alkane simply means that you have carbon and hydrogen, and it's all single bonds. So ethane is one carbon, propane is three carbons, butane is four, pentane is five, hexane is six. So you can kind of see the two, the two three, four, five, six. Uh, before the ethane, it actually is methane for one carbon. And so those hydrogens are all singly bonded to that uh, set of hydrogens, to that set of carbons. 
So, and you probably already have it in your slides, can you see why as we go from top to bottom we are definitely increasing the mass of the molecule, we're increasing the amount that we can go ahead and get those induced dipole, induced dipole going on. So as we increase that, you have to increase your boiling point temperatures. Here's something to kind of put in the back of your mind. If you're working problems, um, you figure room temperature, Celsius temperature scale, you're running at about 23, 25 degrees Celsius. So does this make sense that actually if 23, 25 degrees Celsius is right here, that actually these are actually, uh, these are, these are gases, make sure I get this right, these are gases at 25, and these are actually liquids at 25, does that make sense? So this is room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. So this says actually you can transition from a liquid to a gas at negative 89. Celsius. She's like, oh, wait, 25 is higher than negative 89, so this must be a gas. This must be a gas. This must be a gas. This says you will transition from a liquid to a gas at 36. Well, 25 is lower than 36, so this must be a liquid. And this is also a liquid. I don't know. Something to kind of put in the back of the mind. It's kind of what we're talking about. Okay, so alkanes are hydrocarbons, only contain hydrogen and carbon, and alkanes only have single bonds between those carbon and hydrogen atoms. And then the other thing about alkanes is they are very non -polar. I know there's a little bit of a difference uh, of the electron activity difference between a carbon and a hydrogen, but not much. I think we talked about this yesterday. So alkanes are nonpolar, so if they're going to stick together, they're going to, you're going to have to have these uh, dispersion forces, induced dipole, induced dipole. So alkanes, like we saw in the previous slide, the more massive the alkane, the higher the molecular weight, the higher the boiling point temperature. Okay. With, uh, but there is another factor to it. The other factor actually is surface area. So how can you have a molecule that has the same molecular weight but different surface area? That's because the atoms are kind of configured differently in that molecule. Um, so here we have uh, three different pentanes. A pentane means pent means five, ane means it's an alkane. They all have the same formula, but they're, slightly, they're arranged slightly differently. Uh, yesterday we had some ends, end in front of something. That end means normal, and I call it the hot dog shape. Normal just means it's just a ch -ch -ch like that. If you have any branching, you have to, and we'll talk more about this uh, naming compounds. If you have any branching, you have to say where the branching is. Um, the isopentane and the neopentane kind of say in the iso and the neo how it's kind of configured differently, how those five carbon atoms Kind of the carbon skeleton is configured because notice they are all they all have the same formula and we have different boiling point temperatures so this one down here this one boils at the lower temperature and i always have to concentrate about this i'm not good at memorizing things i kind of have to reconstruct it so the fact that it boils at a lower temperature does that mean that it has stronger intermolecular bond or weaker intermolecular bond weaker boils at the lower temperature Yep. So this must be weaker. This is the weakest. Weakest bonds. And this must be the strongest bonds. Yep. And kind of like we were talking about, I could put 25 degrees Celsius here. And so you figure these would be liquids and this would be a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, let's see what that looks like. What's the difference between the hot dog shape? How can we configure those five carbons differently? And here's the answer. Um, isopentane has the five carbon, the carbon chain arranged this way, where we say we have 
uh, kind of, this would be the straight chain, full carbon straight chain of the four branches. That's isolated. This one over here actually has kind of two branches, where we have kind of the longest chain of carbon we have is three, one, two, three, we have a branch and a branch. Longest chain of carbon here, we have one, two, three, four, branch. Longest chain of carbon there, five, no branch. So here's the deal. This one gets all balled up. You're going to see a picture of it here in a minute. The fact that it gets all balled up makes it hard to kind of create a region of partial negatives and partial positives. It's hard to induce a dipole here. So this one actually was your, your weakest bond. This one will boil at the most. That one will boil at the highest temperature, no branching. So they look like this. There's your hot dog. There's your uh, N-pentane. Um, isopentane, neopentane. And here's one more way to look at it. This is probably the best because you're like, really? Do those really have the same number of carbons and hydrogens? And yeah, they do. Um, but this is all bottled up the most branching. So if you don't have branching, it's a ball, then you're going to have reduced uh, dispersion forces, inner, uh, induced dipole, induced dipole. So kind of to add to what we've been talking about, the boiling points will increase with increasing molecular weight. But um, if you have uh, molecular weights are similar or the same, like we did have a minute ago, then your boiling points are going to get lower or decrease if you have branching. So the branching balls it up. Branching balls it up. And you can't get those dispersion forces induced. Or the, you can't get those dipoles induced. All right. Now on your test and actually in your homework, you're going to kind of have to think through some think through uh, some bit about uh, which is going to have the strongest degree of intermolecular bonds. Um, so I think before sometimes I work with students. If you're given a set of compounds, it gets confusing. My first go-to has always been uh, what we talked about first: ion, ion, uh, ion, dipole, hydrogen bonding, dipole, 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 induced dipole, induced dipole. To me, that's where you go first. After that, then you start to look at the molecular weight and the branch. So with that said, let's kind of look at what we've, we've been most recently talking about. So here we have four carbons, n-pentane. Here we have four carbons, isopentane. And here we have three carbons, propane. Did you guys have the answer to this one? Do you guys have the answers to how they boil? So which which one? The what? This one you can think had the strongest oil, the strongest <laughs> strongest intermolecular bond, oil last, um, highest boiling point. I agree. And then what about these two? I think it's the other way around. I think uh, they're listed actually in order. Uh, that one boils the highest, and then this one, and then this one is the lowest boil. Is that just because it has mm -hmm. Yeah, that's because it has the added. So this one only has uh, three carbons in the hydrogens, and this one has four carbons in the hydrogens. So even though this one's balled up, it's, even though it's balled up, it's still going to be more polarizable, and stronger. Yep. Yep, yep. So, <laughs> yeah, didn't know that's coming. Uh, so, exactly. You said this one would be the hardest one to boil, well, the highest temperature. And then, um, then this one would be the second highest. So, are these, uh, what do you think, are these gases or liquids? It, At 50 chance, yeah, they are gases. 
is it 25 degrees Celsius, and they're boiling at temperatures below that. So, yeah. It, it kind of boggles my mind, but I mean, I, I do fine with it, but it is. So, so these will be due on Monday. We're going to go ahead and start part four. So, everybody say hi to Betty. So, I'm hoping she's going to be listening to these. So, I hope. <laughs> we miss you, Benny. Okay. All right. I like this. Uh, and the, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this idea of equal vapor pressure is it's a it's a player in weather. I don't know whether I'm going to kind of convince you that, but it is like weather, like rain, has to do with uh, boiling vapor pressure of water. Um, I think, but so equilibrium vapor pressure. I'm gonna uh, I. We talked about how equilibrium vapor pressure is related to boiling, okay? But now I'm going to kind of talk about it in a different sense. It still is equilibrium vapor pressure, okay? Equilibrium vapor pressure, vapor pressure is uh, generally, they're used synonymously. When we think about an equilibrium, I usually think, because we'll kind of do this later on in class, if you allow something time to equilibrate, that means uh, that you've given it time to find some. Well, in this case, if I allow the liquid to kind of equilibrate with the headspace above the liquid, I've allowed some of the gas particles to go ahead and kind of fill in this bit of head, what I call headspace above the liquid. This is a, a man, manometer, manometer, manometer. <coughs> Where this little gray thing, I think we've done this before, is actually liquid mercury. So the more the pressure of the gas, the more it actually pushes that liquid mercury up. And we also have kind of nice little pressure gauge on here, so that's kind of fun. Um, so the difference between the first one and the second one is the second one is showing you it's given time to equilibrate. The first one, no equilibration. Basically, you have a head space with no liquid part, no, no particles that are transitioning the liquid to the gas. B actually is showing you now we have extra gas particles in there. What has happened to the pressure gauge? It went up, exactly. What has happened to the liquid mercury? I don't know. Yeah, it looks the same to me too. Yeah. We've run into a few figures with OpenStack. She's like, really? So now, I'm sorry, now I know what this is. Kind of from left to right is time. So basically, when you first start out, there's no vapor, there's no gas particles of that liquid. Give them a little bit of time. We have some gas particles of that liquid. Given more time, we have kind of as many gas particles as we're going to push that liquid. So some of that, and I think you've seen this before, some of those uh, uh, liquid particles have broken their bond with each other and transitioned from the liquid to the gas state. So uh, <coughs> today I uh, brought some of these. I know, like in the morning, I have like a whole bunch of these. They say all the different flavors and stuff. And I just like put a mixture in their pot. So sometimes you go on out and like, oh, that smells good. Frankincense, it's supposed to like make it smart. <laughs> so sometimes I'll put that in my uh, little pot in my office. I'm like, that'll make me smart. I mean, everybody goes, my mom is smarter. That almost, um, that almost kind of sounds like, um, like the whole year is only like, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> showing that I've put up like the whole year. Yeah? yeah? I know, I can't know. It's like I think it's the same. It's super short. <laughs> this is uh, level. My mom's level. Oh no. Really? 
doesn't it doesn't have like a, a broader smell at all. But it's supposed to make it smarter. And I think I <laughs> I think we've talked about this before that if um, you think you're, if you can smell something, it's actually in its gaseous state. So we're going to talk about volatility either today or uh, Monday. But volatility is a measure of something you go ahead and don't go with it to, to a gas. It's something volatile or it's not volatile. So let's say that, like, like getting a point. That's like, there's a few white gas parts. They weren't changes. Well, like, usually you have skin on the bed. That would be a liquid. And kind of think about it. So, if we could do like that. So, what about like some tea? Is it like really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, but yeah, that's true. The table doesn't have any. Release. I guess it would have smells from other things. Liquid dog, gas dog. The dog smell has like so if you yes. can smell it, you have gas dog particles. This is over. Wait, what's your last Oh, my last one I think was just cinnamon. What's that smell? <laughs> There's different kinds of cinnamon. Our our daughter got me some different spices for Christmas. What home is she in these days? And, uh, but I don't know if I told you about that. She does have a chemical engineering degree and she got a job at Cargill. So, wait, what, like, what can you use those for? Can you use those for like, energy? Those like oils, those are like, just like. You can't ingest them. Yeah, you can like put them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Essential Yeah, essential oils. Yeah, and some people are like, you're crazy. But I don't know if they make you feel better than feel bad when you're it like it was good stuff that you don't get to see it. Huh? Or I didn't get this one guy when I was like this weird book by him and he put that on the top of it. I just love that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I've got a friend that she has the list of what you put on what. It's homeopathic or something, which is not a real science necessarily, but I know. But uh, kind of those remind me of this last one, kind of where you see stuff in a slippery state going into sketches. It's in this one. So, Equilibrium vapor pressure. Now, this is, I like this one. This one is similar to the last one. Let's see what you guys think. So, the way this is set up is kind of like the last one. It's kind of go from A to B to C. It's time. So, the first one is the least amount of time, and it, it's water in there. So, we're seeing evaporation. That's the red going up. And so, the difference here is we see some particles in the dome, which would be the water particles, water vapor, water gas, the gray gas particles. And now you see the evaporation, which is the red ones. And so what would the blue ones come about? Mm -hmm. Condensation. Exactly. So we see evaporation and condensation. But if we were to count the evaporations, we have, let's see, six. And we have six evaporations and three condensations. So we haven't given enough time. So this last one is what we call, it's at equilibrium. So a few things. What what would you say about the number of gas particles now in the dome? Saturated. A lot. It's saturated. There's the most amount possible. <laughs> we call this, uh, yeah, the air is saturated with water vapor. Um, and if we count the number of evaporation and condensations going down, they're equal. And this is what we say is at equilibrium. Okay. So, these are kind of an interesting little series of things. So, the first one, picture the first one. This is liquid mercury. This is mercury. 
You can see it's closed up here. So basically what we have is a, a, a liquid mercury barometer. You know how, I think we talked about that, where basically the, the pressure, this is BAR, means barometric pressure. The barometric pressure, the pressure of the atmosphere, shoves the mercury up the column a certain amount. If, you're, if you decrease your pressure by climbing a mountain, you would see actually the liquid mercury would go down, would be less. Okay, so and then so what we do is measure how far that mercury was pushed up. So now though we're kind of changing up using this liquid mercury barometer. We're carefully inserting, I've never done this before, but we have a volatile liquid. What does volatile mean? It means it's going to go from its liquid to the gaseous state. Pretty good. So we have a vol relatively volatile liquid up here. We let it go ahead, less, less density mercury, which is hard to do. So we have a puddle up here. And now can you see where the, the head space, the gas space, the top of that close tube has increased. Now it didn't increase because the pressure dropped. It increased because, yeah, it increased because some of that liquid went ahead and went to its, from its liquid state to its gaseous state. So it's banging around in there and making the mercury go down. It's no longer a barometer. So the way we get the influence of the liquid is to go ahead and subtract that head space. Okay, so you see we have to subtract this, but all the other depression that this went down is due to the new vapor. That's the pressure of the vapor making that. Okay. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter what size, what diameter of tube we have. That's the difference between those two, I think, or how much liquid we have. As long as it's in equilibrium, I guess I should say. That's about, this one's how much liquid, and then it's D actually is the diameter of the tube. And here's an interesting one for you. It looks dangerous. But why is this one more? What's the French show? It's heating up, and what happens when you heat it up? More goes into vapor. Yep. You shift it to a different equilibrium vapor pressure. Well, I think that's good stuff. And the next few slides actually kind of revisit this. So we'll take a running start at it on Monday.